Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Teresa. I'm an alcoholic. Grateful to be here. Grateful to be sober because of a loving God. Thank you for inviting me to your meeting. I want to welcome anybody who's new. Welcome home. Please keep coming back. Um, So many people that are new. Congratulations to your milestones and anyone who will be celebrating. And all the old timers in the house. Thank you for my life and my sobriety. Oh, goodness gracious. Great balls of fire. I'll begin by saying uh, my sobriety date is March 29, 1990. But for the grace of God, sponsorship, 12 steps, 12 traditions, meetings, home groups, it takes a village. I've had the honor and the privilege of being with you all for the last 32 years. Welcome to our Al-Anon. I'm an Al-Anon too, so welcome. (laughs) Been an Al-Anon for 32 years. Keeps me sane and it keeps a lot of people alive. So welcome. I'm glad you're here. you know, again, that's so, so odd that I was looking at that topic. I was like, I think maybe that's the name of their meeting. But dealing with rejection, that's interesting because uh, I don't know if I deal with it other than I have an experience of rejection and I have an opportunity to become aware of what that's all about and then incorporate the 12 steps, how to reach some level of resolve. So I don't know if I've arrived at this place of being okay with being rejected. I still struggle uh, when it happens. And certainly it stems from the abandonment of how I came into this world. You know, I was not wanted. Uh, I'm born addicted. Uh, My mother's an alcoholic. Um, I'll say an alcoholic's anonymous. It's interesting. She has Alzheimer's now. And so I tell people, could you imagine <laughs> she's an alcoholic that doesn't go to meetings, doesn't work any steps, doesn't work with a sponsor, uh, doesn't have any recall. So I'm kind of reliving my childhood. That's kind of, and then she doesn't remember anything about it. So <laughs> she gets to get away with it today because she has Alzheimer's. So that's how, and, um, and so the rejection began there and, and, Certainly, I wasn't cognizant of it at the time, right? I wasn't aware. I didn't come into the world going, I'm unloved and unwanted. I was abandoned at the hospital, and my mother wanted nothing to do with me, and she was happy with my brother, and she hated my father, and she just married him for, you know, to make a boyfriend jealous and got pregnant and had to get married, and my father wanted a family, and so my dad and my grandma bought me home. And so I've been drinking my entire life. Uh, They gave me alcohol in my bottle and left me alone in the house with mom. And she discovered she was alone with me and began to smother me. She thought she can kill me once and for all. We talk about rejection. My mother tried to kill me. And then and I spent the next 24 years her trying to kill me. And then she set a precedent that a bottle of alcohol was to remain in my mouth uh, and, and never to be removed, only to be refilled. Because she recalled them saying, if you give her alcohol, she'll stop crying. And I grew up with a lot of physical abuse, verbal abuse, and sexual abuse. So before I came to you, the first 24 years of my life, abuse was the only thing I ever knew. And the fact that I was unwanted, unnecessary, insignificant, I was not important. Uh, People can do with me as they wanted to. It was as though, and it still comes up today, it's, uh, it's as though life never wanted me. And we talk about self-will. Uh, somehow, I, this still comes up for me. Somehow, I feel like I insisted on coming to this dimension and the universe and the people around it are constantly reminding me that I don't belong here um, and I shouldn't be here. And That's how I spent 24 years of my life. And alcohol just allowed me not to be present for any of it. Uh, Alcohol was the only thing that told me, if nobody loves you, I love you. If nobody wants you, I got you. It's you and me against the world. And you don't have to worry about anything. I'll handle every situation. And in some ways, I remember my sponsor telling me once that I replaced 
my higher power, which was alcohol. My reliance was completely on alcohol. I replaced that relationship with alcohol with Alcoholics Anonymous. It's kind of, it's still similar in the relationship that I have with the God of my understanding here. I'm not under any delusion that I've ever been running on self-will that I've been in charge. I've always needed something else other than me in order to get up in the morning or go to bed at night to go to work. I, I, I've always operated off of something else. And if there's anything that's different in the higher power that I discovered here is that it needed my permission. And that's in step three to make that decision to turn my will and my life over to the care as well as instead of the other higher powers that I had in my life before I came here, the other higher powers robbed rob me of my dignity, my integrity, my self-respect, my identity, right? I was just a human doing rather than a human being. And the higher power that I found here gives me dignity, integrity, self-respect, and self-esteem. And so the one that I've discovered allows me to, even to this day, come to a place of acceptance. I still, it's interesting. My sponsor had pointed that out to me. The same thing that alcohol in a way would say to me, like if nobody loves you, I love you. The higher power that I have today says, if nobody loves you, I love you. If nobody wants you, I want you. Uh, you are my child, you know, so I'm a child of God. You deserve to be here and I'll take care of you. I'll protect you. I'll support you. And that is, I'm 57 years old, and that is how I've been living for 57 years. Whether it's alcohol, my reliance, or the God of reason, or the higher power that I found in Alcoholics Anonymous. And this higher power, the other one was the one that lived outside of me. I depended on everything outside of me, and it always failed. And I failed. The language in the big book talks about we're finite. I am limited and measured. And this higher power is infinite. It is unmeasured and unlimited. And so I feel safer in trusting in this higher power to comfort me when you don't want me. To assure me that I'm enough despite what you think of me. But obviously it's going to come up because I grew up being rejected and unloved and unwanted. And so in the past, I would, you know, I discovered through inventory that I held people hostage or I let you hold me hostage. I mean, I literally was held hostage. I, I, for three years, I thought he was my boyfriend, but he kidnapped me. He was my kidnapper and literally locked me up and kept me held in, uh, in this house. Um, but it didn't matter. I was drinking and he could beat me and have people come and beat me and do things to me. And it didn't matter. I, as long as I was drinking, alcohol told me it didn't matter. And so through inventory, I get to find compassion and forgiveness. I get to see the spiritual malady in others as in me. I've been through a lot in 32 years of sobriety. You know, when I surrendered and say, okay, God, what will you have me be? What will you have me do? My purpose is to stay sober and carry the message. I've been the caregiver to most of my perpetrators and my abusers. And I've been sharing this recently. Mommy has gotten progressively worse. Recently, she had a brain hemorrhage. And, and so she's really not as cognizant. Uh, as before and requires far more than that now as far as the dependence on me mommy's always been dependent on me and um I think about if I ever had a hidden agenda and I'm gonna say hidden agenda because many times through the work I've seen that taking care of my mother uh and being of service to her to me was my assignment given to me by my higher power and through continuous writing, it was like, you know, if at any point I had a hidden agenda to finally get the validation, recognition from, from the one person. I mean, I've been to a lot of people who just don't like me or don't want me, but the one person who's never wanted me since I was conceived, 
if my agenda had ever been to care for her because one day, just one day before she leaves this planet, she will acknowledge me. She will recognize me. That will be pure insanity because even now she has dementia. She has Alzheimer's. So she, even if I wanted to, it's never going to happen, right? She doesn't even know that the one that's taking care of her, the one that, that she's mistreated her entire life, the one that she's just, oh my goodness, hates the ground that I walk on and despise. Even in recovery, mommy's been sober and that didn't change anything. Even in that, she doesn't recognize that I'm the one that's feeding her, giving her medicine, changing her. That, if that's not joke on me, I don't know what is. And so what is that level of acceptance? Do I do it so that others, do I do the things that I do so that others can recognize me or I do them because that is, you know, my sponsor said we get to my authentic self. My authentic self is kind and loving and compassionate and considerate. And I do that because my defects of character of selfish, self-centered, self-seeking and dishonesty is continuously being removed so that I could just be, whether you like me or not, whether mommy recognizes me or not. And something happens. There's a thing around here that we talk about a psychic change. This program is not just about drinking. For me, it means so much more. I put the plug in the jug and picked up the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I begin to live an entirely different life. For me to drink again, it's not just to be drinking and the misery of the lashes of alcoholism or the torture of alcoholism or the consequences as a result of it or the manifestation of my allergy. My allergy. It's to go back to a life of despair, of being disconnected, of not loving self. That's what I've gained in recovery, that it's not so much what you think of me, but what do I think of me? And it's been challenging. Uh, a few years ago, um, I'm a priest. I've been initiated. I went back to my religious, my family religious thing. And that's a whole other story. And, um, and a few years ago, everyone within my religious community completely through jealousy. It felt like the movie, uh, it felt like Othello. I mean, I had like a Shakespeare experience. <laughs> uh, I remember, uh, calling my grand sponsor and I and I was saying I must be at fault that it's like a witch hunt everyone is has left me abandoned me their character assassinating me and oh it was horrible I'm talking about people from Africa to Cuba people I've known for 30 years 40 years it was it was just horrible and I was saying something's wrong with me this level of betrayal and abandonment and rejection from this entire religious community that I've known, cultivated, something's wrong with me. And I was like, because the big book says, we're the cause of our own problems. We step on the toes and our fellows and they retaliate. So I must be a monster. I must be everything that they're saying about me. It has to be true because so many people are saying it. And he was like, you take everything so literal. He was like, I said, look, I learned that if one person calls you a duck, you don't worry about it. Two people, you wonder. Three people, you start saying quack, quack, right? So I'm like, so I got more than three people. And he's like, no, that only applies if, let's say, you're in London and they call you a duck. And then you go to Canada and they call you a duck. And then you're in California and they call you a duck. But when you have the same people in the same place that know one another, that's called the conspiracy. And I was like, what? <laughs> I, I tell you, that never occurred to me. It was like, it's an actual conspiracy against you to steal every your crown. It's a long story. I mean, literally, my father's a king. I'm a princess. It's so crazy. Whatever. It's a long story. Like, they're literally trying to steal your legacy. My father was dying at the time. And everything he is religiously and spiritually was being passed down to me. And I was the next leg, whatever. It was insane. I'm telling you, it was like a Shakespeare movie. But he was like, it's a conspiracy. But that's not my knee-jerk reaction, right? My knee-jerk reaction was something's wrong with me. 
the reason why you don't want to be with me is because something's wrong with me. I'm not the one that goes, something's wrong with you. <laughs> and so I continue to work on that. It comes up often. Someone asked me not too long ago on an interview, um, how do I do with sponsees leaving? You know, if there are new sponsees and that, that we haven't developed that level of relationship, right? I'm kind of okay, right? Because there's really no commitment that we make with sponsorship, one alcoholic talking to another. But I have experience working with someone for 17, 18, 20 years, and then one day them tell me you're no longer significant. I don't know about you, I don't care how graceful I need to be or how much acceptance and work I've done on myself, that hurts. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? It's kind of like, and I've had that done without a without a conversation. I'm talking about a text. Like, I no longer want to talk to you anymore. You're like, we just talked on the phone a couple of hours ago. Like, I'm so confused. And that will haunt me because I'm looking at what did I do to cause that? Again, I always go back to that. Where am I at fault? And so what's interesting about most of my inventory, my fourth column, is it's easy for me to take responsibility before I even look at you. So most of the work I've had to do around here is literally my sponsors looking at me going, it's not you. I mean, I just I take on everything. I have some sponsors that tell me they get mad at me. They're like, I normally got to call you so I can finally get to where I'm at fault, right? But that's your, that's my need. That's my, my first go-to is something happens is my fault. And so I continue to do the work on it. But it does hurt. Uh, it just hurts. I, I felt, I have felt like, I'm an old pair of shoes and just thrown away or an old rag. Um, it still comes up. You're not that important. Not enough. Why does it come up? Because I, I stay forever. <laughs> you know what I mean? I stay despite, I think what comes up for me is I get resentful. I get jealous. I'm like, I, if I know that that's the rules, I could have left like 10 years ago because I've never liked you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but because I come from that world of not being wanted, I want everybody. Do you know what I mean? Despite your flaws, despite the things that I see, you know, that I always get that story about if you bring home the frozen snake and you give it milk and you put it by the fire. And then when the snake bites you, you're like, why did you bite me? It's like, you knew I was a snake when you brought me in here. Well, that I get that story a lot. <laughs> because somehow I, I live vicariously through others believing that everyone is worth it. And that's because that's what I want, right? You do unto others as you have them done to you. But instead, it's unappreciated. And, um, and I get dinged and I get stung and it hurts. And I think where I'm at today, I'm 57. I'll be, my birthday's coming up on the 23rd. I'll be 57. I'm 32 years sober. If there's anything that's happening with this whole idea, I can't say that I'm over it or I'm no longer doing it, concerned about rejection or dealing with it. I think I'm maturing into a place of not judging it. And what I mean by that is I remember a few years ago, my brother has died. My father died. All that had happened all around the same time, a lot of losses. And I was in such a dark place. The one, the one energy I don't ever want to reject me is God. Um, when I feel God rejects me, just thinking about it, I, I don't know what I would do. Anyway. If God ever rejected me, I, whenever I feel God rejects me, I need to find him quickly because that's a horrible feeling. Um, but I was in a dark place because I really thought that God rejected me. It was horrible. And I called someone, an old timer, and all she kept saying, everything that I shared, she kept saying, I don't know. I'm just no longer in judgment. And I was like, <sighs> and I would say something else. And she would go, <sighs> I'm just no longer in judgment. And I hung up from that, like most of the time, talking all the time is, thank you. Thank you very much. That was helpful. 
appreciate it. That was very intense, right? <laughs> so profound. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to put it on the shelf and I'll pick it up later when I when it makes sense to me. And it wasn't until like about two or three years later, I was talking to somebody and I said, I don't know. I'm just no longer in judgment. <laughs> and I was like, that's what you were talking about. <laughs> and so I think that's where I'm at with it. You know, I'm no longer in judgment about things coming up. I'm no longer beating myself up because I'm concerned about that or the awareness that I have of unfinished business or the disturbances. I think that I'm, I'm grateful for the gift of awareness. And I get to see it. And we have tools around here where we get to uncover, discover, and discard. There is a solution or not. Um, I, I mean, there's, that comes up for me often. Uh, I do the best I can. And, and sometimes it's not met with appreciation. That happens to me often. And I need to look at my own motives. Uh, what were my intentions? And if I have good intention and your response is different, I've had to ask God to let go and let God. But I'll tell you, that's a conversation that takes place with my sponsor a lot. My sponsor is always like, when's Teresa going to look out for Teresa? Where most alcoholics, you have to get out of self, right? Extreme selfishness um, and be selfless. I've always been selfless. And so... The world makes me sad sometimes. People are mean and cruel and inconsiderate. And so I allow that to teach me. I don't ever want those things to change my goodness. And I think that's what comes up is my bitterness is I don't want to be good because you threw me away. Or I'm bad. And said is today, I'm like, I don't think anyone gets to rob me of my goodness and my kindness and my tenderness, my compassion, my service, because you don't accept it. My sponsor used to tell me, we're going to get to your authentic self. And I'm a good person. I remember my brother used to tell my mother, he was so spiritually mature. He used to say to my mother, I'm a good son and it's not my fault you don't know that. And I'm not responsible for you to know it. And I would hear him say that and I never got it because I would just try to get her to see it, you know? But I get it today. I'm a good daughter, even if she doesn't notice. I'm a good friend, partner, neighbor, sponsor, sponsee, even if you don't notice. And so today I'm not judging that. I just recognize when it comes up, it's an opportunity to clean house. And remember the seven step says, God, take all of me, good and bad. So I don't even get to determine what goes away and what stays. What I get to do is I get to be a witness. I become the observer. I become willing. And I have an experience. And that experience is going to help others. Like (laughs) everything that I do. There's sometimes I go through stuff like that and I be like, I swear God, this better help somebody. This better, I swear, this better change lives. I'm not playing. <laughs> I am not going through all this just to be going through it. So I become more tender uh, with me. And in turn, I'm able to be tender with you. But I, I can't say that I'm completely free from the desire of wanting to be loved, respected, appreciated, and considered. And I think if I ever, if that's ever gone, then I don't know if I'm having a human experience. 
Uh, I think in some ways I'll be going back to being a human doing. Because before I came to you, none of that mattered. You know what I mean? I had no emotion. I was completely detached and disconnected and not present. So today I say, don't rob me from the experience. Uh, when I'm heartbroken, that means I loved. I, that means I loved. How could you be heartbroken if you didn't love? And so I take both. I don't know how much time I have. You got to tell me how much time I have. I don't know where I'm at. I'm, I can't see a clock or anything. Um, should I be shutting up now? Mark, can you answer that? Yeah, we'll up to another 25 minutes, if you wish. I have 25 more minutes? Yeah. Okay. Oh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, my goodness gracious. I, um, man, that's why I was like, what a topic, you guys. I'm like, okay, we are disrobing up in here. Not that I'm not always transparent, because that's the only thing that I have found my freedom is through transparency, where I'm able to just tell on myself. Um, I, I lived in a facade. I live, you know, they talk about alcoholics live these double lives. Well, I didn't even have a double life. My entire life was just a camouflage, right? I was a speck among, I was like a fly on the wall. My identity had everything to do with everything looking pristine and in order on the outside. I wasn't even aware that I was dying on the inside. And so today I get to be very transparent and I get to tell you, um, I think the safest place that I found about rejection, believe, and I was just, again, talking with someone else about this, is um, the Rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Here is the one place where I belong and the traditions do that for me. I learned the traditions long before the steps and the traditions keep me safe among you. It keeps you safe among me. The traditions say I'm a member because I say I am. You don't have to like me and I don't have to like you, but I have a seat. You know, they still joke in my uh, home group going, Hey, Teresa, I'm a member because when I was new, I used to walk around going, I'm a member. I have a desire. I don't like you either, okay? But you need to help me, all right? I don't like you either. And we have to help each other. And so I still, <laughs> I'm a member. Uh, I'm this Puerto Rican, you know, I'm from New York City. And um, I never hung out with anybody else other than Puerto Ricans. I know they say New Yorkers are a melting pot, but really we're very segregated. And I come into Alcoholics Anonymous and I'm around people that are not really Puerto Ricans. I don't know if you got Puerto Ricans out there in, uh, in the UK, but uh, <laughs> uh, Puerto Ricans, we're very animated and proud people. We're a commonwealth, so we have a sense of entitlement and we're American, but not whatever, right? <laughs> we're on this island and very tribal and and we tend to just kind of, we're tribal people. We, You know, I tell folks I didn't, you know, I'm still learning how to have friends because I all my friends are my cousins. I mean, I have one uncle that got 36 kids. I don't think I need friends in the neighborhood. You know, like, <laughs> and we all hang out with each other. And so Alcoholics Anonymous told me principles before personality. So that means that your personality is not in the equation. My personality is not in the equation. That it doesn't matter if you're not Puerto Rican. I'm not going to lie. It helps if you are. There's no way I'm going to sit here and tell you that I don't consider that as a bonus. Because if you're Puerto Rican, it does make a difference to me. I'm just going to say that, okay? I'm just going to say it. It helps big time. <laughs> the dynamics change. When you're Puerto Rican, there's something that happens. No connection. I got one sponsee that's Puerto Rican, and you just see the two of us together. It's a mess. <laughs> we are really intense. Uh, <laughs> the moment I met her, <laughs> I met her at treatment. And when she came home, the day she came home, her entire family was there. They all have me on speed dial. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we're all a family. They've met my whole family. So anyway, but what it tells me is it doesn't matter if you're Puerto Rican. We get to help one another. We get to work with one another. We get to share with each other. And we get to look at our similarities, even though they could be differences. Your political views don't matter. 
your religious options or practices don't matter. The music you listen to, the the books you've read. I'm safer in my conversations with people in the rooms to just talk about the program than to talk about those other things. The moment I start talking about those other things, I don't like you very much. And you usually end up not liking me. <laughs> we have least, you know, least things in common. So the traditions give me the safety uh, of rejection. In the world, I think I'm always rejected in some way. Um, at least I'm loved by many until nobody wants to love me anymore. And then that's just been my experience. And they just throw me away. Um, without Anyway, that's so, that comes up a lot for me. I don't know what that's about. Where people just disappear. They just disappear. And I know people say people come in seasons, but I, I attach to, you know what I mean? I look for you. I, I, you know what I mean? I look for people in my life. Um, I think one of the hardest things I came on, we're talking about outside. In the rooms, rejection, you could do whatever you want. I'm a member. I belong here. It doesn't matter your, your preferences, your personality. I get to look past that and keep it moving. Like I can go into meetings with people who don't like me part of the people who wanted to character assassinate me when we're in the rooms we're just drunks and that's it no one gets to throw me out of aa or you know what i mean like it doesn't matter but i'll go through that with family members you know my brother died i put him on life support and that's a whole other story that was very difficult my only brother older brother and he used to abuse me, but through AA, I just love the relationship that we began to develop and, and what it grew into. But he has two boys, you know, and I helped raise these boys and they love their Titi very much. And they're now uh, 19 and 23. And they're growing up and, and they're finding their independence. You know, the oldest 23, not too long ago, you know, he was he was challenging everything I was saying, you know, and no, you don't know. And, you know, all this stuff. And I told him, I remember the day when you used to gaze at me and be like, you're the most beautiful woman in the whole world. <laughs> and you know, everything. I was like, what happened to that? <laughs> What's going on? And then I went to his, you know, I went to see him. He moved, he graduated from college and, and he was just saying, you know, you stay in the car and you don't know anything and you're embarrassment and you're embarrassing. Um, oh, my heart was broken. And I had to pray on that. And I had to do inventory on that. And be prepared for him to reach some conclusion that I'm no longer significant, you know, in his life. That was hard. And I called them. I'm not sure what I did wrong. Do you know what I mean? I, I really was not, I'm not aware of anything that I caused that. And I was like, I, what was it that I did to change the dynamics of the level of disrespect that I received that day? That's different for me, y'all. See, where normally, you know what I mean? Where am I responsible? I really realized I didn't do anything to deserve that. And that's growth for me. What was that about? And I know that you could be changing and growing and looking at things different from me, but that was disrespectful and that hurt my feelings. And he said, I knew the moment you said you wanted to talk to me, that's what it was about. And he apologized. He apologized to me and said it was wrong. But he was going through some stuff. He's trying to, you know what I mean? He's 23. He was trying to find his identity and family and I don't know. I was feeling like imitation of a imitation of life. I don't know. It's, it's a movie about a black woman. You know, daddy's black. I don't know. There was a lot of white. He was around a lot of white people. It was very strange. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I was like, what's going on? <laughs> I'm having an experience of imitation of life. So, <laughs> but to me, that was growth. But people in my personal life, it matters to me what you think about me. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it doesn't. That's crazy. I think that's dishonest. We're in a world that we, we we need each other. I don't live in an island by myself. But I think what the work requires is that I'm not willing to sell my soul just so you can love me today. 
I'm not willing to compromise my morals and my values just so you can accept me today. Where there was a time I was so willing to do that. And the reason why I'm not willing to do that today is because what I discovered is that insanity returns and we drink again. And if there's one thing that I cherish more than anything else on this planet, including my nephews, I don't have words to describe how much I love these boys. I'll lay my life on the line for them. The one thing I cherish is my sobriety. You can take a lot of things away from me. But my sobriety is the only thing I can throw away. You can't take my sobriety away from me, but me. And if it means accepting you, if it means being hurt by your choices and doing the work I need to do to let that go and let God, then I'm willing to do it. Because the last thing I ever want to do is to get stuck on how much you don't want me, you don't love me. I tell people all the time, I may have so many question marks in my life. Where I'm going to live, if I got money, no money, job, no job, uh, in relationship, loving me, wanting me, needing me, uh, conspiracies. I can have all of these question marks, whether you're going to live, whether you're going to die, so many question marks. But the one thing I don't ever want to have a question mark is that I'm an alcoholic. Sometimes I can even have a question mark that there's no God. but I don't have a question mark that I'm an alcoholic. Somehow that certainty is my anchor because I don't have to figure out you loving me, leaving me, staying, getting the job, getting the money, where I'm going to live, where I'm not. I don't have to figure none of that stuff out. The only thing I got to do is treat my alcoholism. And somehow that carries me to the solution about all of it it's amazing i remember when all that stuff happened my brother called me said where are you i said i'm about to go into a meeting early to put some chairs up because you know what i can't figure out what all those people are doing but what i can do is i could you know i can go put some chairs up in the meeting and say hi to a newcomer when my brother died and i watched that line go flat on that machine I walked out and I went into the kitchen and my oldest nephew followed me and I turned to him and I said, okay, look, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing right now. I don't know. I'm supposed to be screaming, consoling you, hugging you, telling you something. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing right now, but you know what? I know how to make coffee. <laughs> Cause I do that in the meetings. <laughs> I'm going to make a pot of coffee. <laughs> and he was like, that makes sense, Titi. This is the first time your bro your brother died, your only brother. It's the first time my father died. Of course, we don't know what to do. So I'll help you to make coffee. <laughs> so I get to never reject my sobriety. I never get to throw away my sobriety, uh, take it for granted, rest on my laurels. Uh, allow outside influences and challenges and obstacles to get in the way uh, of my relationship with God and my usefulness and the work that I need to do in my recovery. I think that's what empowers me the most. There's a, there's a paragraph in the big book that I don't know about you, but it really empowered me. It said, we squander the hours. People actually have the ability to kill us. And somehow when I read that, I felt empowered. I will no longer give people permission to rob me of my peace and my sanity so that I could drink again. So I'm willing to clean house. And I ran to the remaining steps. And that's what I get to do today. And I get to cry sometimes about it. I get to be heartbroken and disappointed. And I heard a woman tell me years ago, she said, Teresa, God gives you a heart with a hundred percent warranty. And there's no small print. It's a lifetime warranty that comes with your heart. And whenever it's broken, God will repair it or he'll give you a new one. And so whenever I'm heartbroken, I know that I have a lifetime warranty 
that God will either repair it or he'll restore me with a new one. And then I just go get to be of service to other people and share it. So that's where I've been at. I've been hurt a lot, you guys. I've been disappointed and discarded. And I've got mad at God and worried and thinking that he's abandoned me. But then I think about Jesus Christ himself was on the cross and said, God, why have you forsaken me? And if Jesus Christ himself can have a moment like that, I think I can have a moment sometimes where I go, God, what the hell is going on? (laughs) I would say, I'm in the garden. I'm in the garden. And whenever I'm in the garden and whenever I'm not sure, I can reach out to you guys. I always say, I don't look for the light at the end of the tunnel. I look for somebody with a flashlight. Thank God we're not all crazy on the same day. And just recently, I was going through that. You know, I, I, we had the COVID thing, and my partner got COVID and became completely disabled. So I take care of two people who are completely disabled and ungrateful. <laughs> so I say the third floor is the ICU unit. They can't do anything for themselves. And... So everybody kept telling me, you should reach out for support. Uh, They have uh, public health, you know, services and people affected with COVID. And I did. And I even talked to my landlord. I said, are you sure this program works? It can help me with the rent. It was at the very end. I was like, okay, because I'm struggling. I don't, I take care of my mom. I don't have no income. And she lost her income. They said, yeah, they can help you. They can help you. And I really thought they kept saying, don't worry. Don't worry. We're going to help you. And in the end, they didn't help us. And then the landlord said, you're going to be evicted. I just came out of that. God, why have you forsaken me? I wasn't running on self-will. Why are these people being mean to me? My mother just had a brain hemorrhage. My partner is completely disabled. I'm financially broken. COVID has kicked our butt. What is happening? And they were like, we don't care about you. We don't care what's going on in your life. Give us your money or get out. (sighs) And people will call me and say, have hope, have faith. I'm like, right now, I don't. But you have it. So I need you to have it for me. I need you to have hope for me. I need you to have faith for me. I'm going to hold on to you. I'll get it eventually, but I'm going to hold on to with you. Just give me a minute. That's my saying. Just give me a minute. And some people in the program did a little fundraiser and raised some money, and God showed off and showed out. And I was like, the blessing is to each and every one of you, God's little earth angels. And I found out we're going to stay. I'm like, okay, God. But I was bitter and angry. So I had the inventory so I don't stay mad at the at the property owner and the <laughs> and the only thing that I came away from that too was looking at my fears of being homeless. What was that all about? I watched the disease of alcoholism every day go toe-to-toe in a debate with the grace of God and I was like watching tennis and I was agreeing with both of them (laughs) I thought they both had very good arguments (laughs) and I just needed to treat my alcoholism because I couldn't figure that out that stuff was way too big for me so I always I'm sure my time's about up I always like saying you know God's a show off around here I know I got another drink in me, but every part of me tells me if I leave you, I will not have another recovery. So I can't get caught up on some of these things, you know? But I always say he takes a girl like me, unloved, unwanted, unnecessary, and insignificant. Such a trip. Picks me up. Dusses me off. Builds me up. So you can see what he can do. I can't take any credit for it. I can't even pat myself on the back. I just needed a mustard seed of willingness. 
And I say to the newcomer, if this power can do it for a girl that's nothing to most people in life, I am so insignificant to a lot of people. Could you imagine what he can do for you? That's a show off to me. But he gave me a purpose. And my purpose is to stay sober and carry the message. That's it and that's all. He tells me I'm one of his favorites. But he tells you the same thing. I'm going to continue to cultivate this relationship with this power to the best of my ability. And when I'm unsure, I hope you continue and remain to cultivate your relationship so I can lean into you. (laughs) So if you knew I need you, I need you to stay because I need you so much. I thank you all for doing a 12 step call on me. I I'm grateful to the miracles that happen around here. And real quick, if you're new, let me tell you what the miracle is. Because you'll hear a lot of talk around here about miracles. But it clearly tells me and defines it in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. It talks about it in step 10. Sanity returns. And the idea of drinking is just gone. So in all the situations that I shared with you, even a few months after my brother dying, my dad died. And daddy loved me unconditionally. And I don't have words to explain watching my dad take his last breath looking in my eyes. I knew that the only person on earth that loved me was him. And he was leaving. And all these things that I share with you that happened to me, I'm going to tell you the miracle. That still has me in awe to this day. A drunk like me. That didn't go one day without a drink. Not one day before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. This is a miracle. Not a thought occurred to me to drink. Not a thought. Isn't that something? Not one thought occurred to me to drink. that's the miracle without any effort on my part it just comes but if you're new there's a disclaimer this is only true if we remain in fit spiritual condition and it don't matter what I did yesterday It don't matter what I'm going to do tomorrow. It only matters what I do today. So that's why I'm here with you right now. Thank you so much for allowing me to share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.